to me earlier in the week, you said this is coming home, this event. Yes, well, uh, firstly, let me say that I'm just um, overwhelmed to uh, to be here and to hear my sister. Um, That's you know, what it sounded there. like in October at the official Canadian launch of a new memoir by Professor Ruth Weiss and that she chose Montreal and the Jewish Public Library's Jewish Book Month to host the launch of her book was no accident. Although she's lived in the U.S. for decades, Montreal was where Weiss and her family settled. Her family arrived in Canada in 1940 when she was just four years old. She's now 85, and in that lifetime, Weiss went on to become one of the world's foremost experts on Yiddish literature and Jewish culture. She's also an outspoken conservative commentator, a fierce defender of the state of Israel, And in her new book called Free as a Jew, she reveals her experiences with cancel culture and Jew hatred on campus, where she taught for 30 years at Harvard University. Weiss is also one of the few voices critical of how North American Jewish communities focus on commemorating and teaching about the Holocaust instead of what she thinks they should do, which is to showcase the modern miracle of Israel and Judaism's success. Do we know anything about Judaism? Haven't we learned anything from Judaism? What Judaism has taught us is that you teach the good, is that you teach how you should behave. And when you teach the no's, you say, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not this. And then you raise, you, the Jewish people, create some museum about killing and, and, and about all these amazing forms of killing and reducing people to nothing. And wow, that is going to prevent evil in the future. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Wednesday, December the 8th, 2021. Welcome to the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Ruth Weiss's scholarly life and her personal life have intertwined with some of the biggest names in modern Jewish culture, including the late Rabbi David Hartman, Shalom Aleichem, Isaac Beshevis Singer, Ayel Peretz, Mendel Meuchers Feuerim, Saul Bellow, Louis Dudek, and of course, Leonard Cohen. She was the one who helped Cohen publish his first book of poems, but Weiss always wished he had chosen to be an academic like her. Weiss's new book reads more like a novel. She lays out how being a child Holocaust survivor influenced her life, how she remains grateful to Canada, and how her mother filled the house with Yiddish culture in the vibrant post-war Jewish scene in Montreal. Fast forward to today, and Weiss outlines her concerns about the challenges facing North American Jewry. Coming up, Professor Weiss will be here to share her call to action. But first, here's what's making news elsewhere in Canada right now. I'm Zachary Brown in Tel Aviv, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like. Since the CBC's already announced it, we can tell you that the winner of the Great Canadian Baking Contest was not the Jewish contestant. Remember Stephen Levitt of Aurora, Ontario? We interviewed him in November about how he channels his late Bubby's cooking as one of the 10 amateur bakers on this season's show. Levitt did make it to the finals. The episode aired on Sunday. His baking career, though, has certainly taken off. People are asking him to make cakes for all sorts of occasions, and you can follow his creations on Instagram, which is (laughs) gratefulbaker243. Professor Weiss joins us now from New York, and I guess I should tell you before we bring her on that when I was in my early 20s, I took a Jewish studies course at McGill in order to complete my degree in journalism, and she was my professor. She'd actually founded McGill's Jewish studies program. And while I don't remember whether I got good marks or not, I always remembered her distinctive voice and her passion for her material. Congratulations on your new book. You're busy now with promoting it in the last couple of weeks. How has the reception been? Well, the formal reception has been quite wonderful. I have gotten uh, really uh, wonderful reviews. Um, and uh, also in uh, the Jerusalem Post and in commentary this month and, and just very wonderful feedback from people. Um, so I'm uh, pretty buoyed by this because, um, you know, it, it's a memoir. And, and it's personal, as I say, but I call it a, a personal memoir of national self-liberation, because in fact, what I try to testify to in this, in telling this story about myself, is really the history of mostly the Jews uh, in the period of my life, and it is um, quite an amazing story. I mean, if you've been a member of the Jewish people from 1936 
to 2021, you've really been a um, privilege to be at the center of Jewish history at the most amazing time in, in Jewish history and uh, at a very important turning point in the history of, of Western civilization as well. So I found that when I started to write this story, I began it quite personally uh, because of my family situation. And as you described, because I wanted to describe Montreal in a flourishing period, there are many things that I really wanted to tell about. However, by the time I got to the middle and uh, to the final chapters, what I was telling um, was in many ways um, very worrisome. And uh, as much as I had been witness to the rise of the state of Israel, which I describe as the greatest miracle that I know of in human civilization, I was also now becoming witness to a decline in North American life and particularly in the university where I had spent my entire life. It was almost um, like a warning. Um, we had better pay attention very quickly because things are already um, at a state beyond anything that one might have anticipated. Well, I mean, there's so many themes to get into. And so let's just pivot to one theme of the book, which is that left-leaning Jews, um, you say, are Judaism's biggest problem right now. And they basically are, as you said, detracting more than the non-Jews to the success and the safety of being Jewish in North America. Um, and you personally experienced that, of course, uh, at Harvard for daring to, you know, support positions that are not woke. In the early stages, you know, there was a time when every Jew would have defined themselves as a liberal, which most American and Canadian Jews still do, uh, you know, without thinking to stand for liberalism with a capital L meant that you had to be on the side of the Jews as Jews after the Shoah after the rise of the state of Israel, how could one fail to see that the real meaning of a liberal society, which is self-accountable, which doesn't blame others, which can never go into anti-Semitism, how can one fail to see that all that has to do with being able to accept the Jews as they are? These two things are interconnected. So in a sense, the question of left and right it is not simple the way people sometimes think of it. It's just that the attack from the right is pretty obvious and no Jew is going to fall for it. In other words, if I tell you that I'm coming to destroy you because you are insignificant or because you are descendant of the apes and the monkeys or whatever it is, oh, then you know you'll get the Jews to stand up and say, no, no, that's not me. Jews would never join that movement. But if I come to you and I say to you, you know, you're really responsible for my suffering and you'd better do something about it. Somehow Jews are very susceptible to that. People uh, think that it's liberal to be guilty. Well, you see, it's immoral to take on guilt for something that you're not responsible for. And it is evil to take on some responsibility for something that you cannot help. Uh, what does it mean to feel sorry for nativism? I mean, I understand that one didn't plan uh, and one cannot rewrite history. Well, I don't think that that is what they want to do, but uh, I, I'd like to um, to explore one of the things that that you also said um, about Edward Said, and we'll we'll broaden it and talk about how on university campuses where you personally experienced this uh, cancel culture of any ideas that are not acceptable at the moment. Um, and we've re we've been reporting a lot. I've been reporting a lot in Canada about how it's difficult to be Jewish in Canadian university campuses because of the narrative that's been accepted that it's better, it's it's acceptable to be anti-Semitic and it's acceptable and encouraged and actually um, uh, cool to be pro pro uh, Palestinian and and anti-Zionist at the same time. It's our responsibility to understand that this is a war against the West. That this is a war against the civilization that we thought we were a part of. This is the, 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 that the fight against Zionism or the apartheid things on campus or something and the, and the Palestinian movement, that's a movement of grievance and blame. 
where just as Israel became the unifying element of the Arab League that was founded in 1945, just as anti-Semitism was the organizing unit of all those movements that were anti-liberal in their time. It's always against something that the Jews represent, not that the Jews themselves are. And so the Jew, singular or collective, who says, oh my God, I, I, I've got to, I've got to solve this Palestinian issue. We must not oppress them. You know, the minute the Jew says that, he is handing an immense victory to all the most evil forces in the world today. You know, we're speaking, um, Professor, right before North American Jewish communities mark uh, Holocaust Education Week, Holocaust Remembrance Week, Chris Delnach, and a lot of uh, time in your book was spent talking about what you thought is a mistake in how Holocaust education and commemoration was taught and venerated versus focusing on the miracle of Israel and Jewish renewal. Um, it's not a popular, it's not a popular, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you know, it's not a popular thing to say that. Well, you're, you're very dear. Uh, but in fact, you know, that's one of the things that I try to bring out in my book. Should we mourn the Holocaust? Well, of course. What else can we do? Do we have to have a memorial for it at the center of Jewish life? Of course we do. So there it was. And there it still is in that building is that part of it is dedicated to the commemoration of the Holocaust. But then I've just read that the Montreal Jewish community is putting up a Holocaust museum. I couldn't believe it. I feel so, uh, you know, I feel that this is such a terrible wrong. And now at a stage of time when you can already see that this is not the way to educate North American uh, uh, kids. People who know nothing about the Jews, this is the way you're going to introduce them to the Holocaust? I, I cannot, you see, I cannot see one argument for it. I can see every argument for the Jews really building into their Judaism, another form of commemoration for this, the greatest of all tragedies that ever befell the people. Of course we have to mourn it, but to ask the world to, under, to know German history, to ask the world to see German brutality and to think that that is going to prevent something, you know, do we know anything about Judaism? Haven't we learned anything from Judaism? What Judaism has taught us is that you teach the good, is that you teach how you should behave. And when you teach the no's, you say, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not this. And then you raise, a, 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 you, the Jewish people, create some museum about killing and, and, and about all these amazing forms of killing and reducing people to nothing. And wow, that is going to prevent evil in the future. Who came up with this idea? I do not have sympathy for wanting that story told to the Canadian people as the Jewish contribution to civilization. It's not. And if we have a contribution to civilization, it's Judaism that we should be teaching. That is our positive. <music> And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. Let me know what you think of the professor's book and her thoughts. You can reach me as usual at ebessner with two S's at the cjn.ca. Today's listener shout out goes to Susan Lapel of the National Council of Jewish Women's High Branch in Toronto. They've been meeting for over 40 years. And we'll end the episode with Stephen Levitt, the finalist of the Great Canadian Baking Show of this season and what his experience was like. Levitt appeared on a special Zoom the other night for a Facebook group called Creative Cooking, Caring is Sharing. I went into every day with two thoughts. One, which is something that my wife Stacy told me while I was practicing, and it was a day that it was just like, I was, I was, it, it was those bear cookies. I'm telling you, those were the hardest things on the planet to make. They just, I, I almost, I was almost in tears. Like everyone left the kitchen. I, cause I didn't know what I was doing. There's no point of reference. There's nothing on YouTube for these things. And 
I finally got it done. I, I don't know what it's going to look like on the inside. And we cut it, and it looked like a bear. And I just started to cry. <laughs> and she looked at me. She says, just remember to find the joy. You love this. So even in the stress, find the joy. And so I would walk into the tent, and I would hear her voice saying that. And I actually would tell the other bakers just before they would start, I'd say, remember, we love to bake. Find the joy in it. And the other part of it was... I didn't look at it like I had to do this in two hours or four hours. I looked at it like I get to bake today. 